everyone and welcome to the second video in my series on starting seeds indoors. If you missed the first video, that covers everything from preparing the things that you're going to plant in, to giving heat, to watering your seedlings, and the link to that is right in the notes underneath here, so go and take a look at that if you haven't seen that yet. This video is about what happens after your seeds have germinated. There's a whole bunch of things that you need to do at this point to make sure that you have healthy seedlings that grow into plants that you can put into your garden. Once your seeds have germinated, they're going to need several things to keep them healthy. Number one thing, and the most important thing for your seedlings, is light. If they don't have enough light, they're going to get spindly, they're going to be weak, and they're just not going to grow. So, let's talk about lighting. Now, here are a whole bunch of seedlings that I've grown, and they're pretty good. They're fairly stocky, they're pretty much upright. Um, these ones are a little leggy. That's because I didn't get the light on them soon enough. Now, if you're lucky enough that you've got a south-facing window and you get at least 12 hours of strong, direct sunlight every day, then you're lucky. You can probably grow your seedlings right there. But if you're like most of us, you don't have that kind of light. And in that case, you're going to need some sort of artificial light to keep your seedlings healthy. And you have a lot of options for that. Very cost-effective options as well as some more expensive pre-made kits for you. So let's talk about lighting. Now with seedlings, they need two different types of wavelength of lights or color of light. They need blue light and they need red light. Now sunlight includes all of those, right? But when it really comes down to it, those are the two that are most important for your seedlings. So red light stimulates the growth of leaves and flowers. So if you have good red light, you're going to get nice, bushy, leafy plants. If you don't have enough light, red light, they're going to be spindly looking things and weak. Okay. Blue light does something different. It regulates the growth, the overall size of plants. So if you've got good um, blue light, good amounts of blue light, you're going to get nice, stocky plants, not leggy. Um, and they're going to be fairly, fairly strong. If, on the other hand, you have too much blue light, your plants are going to be stunted and they're not going to grow at all. So you want to have a nice combination of red and blue light. How do you do that? Well, you have some options. First of all, incandescent light. Don't use it. All right? Just a normal incandescent bulb generally doesn't have the kinds of wavelength that you want. They also get pretty hot and you could end up burning the leaves on your plants. You don't want that. So what most people do is they use fluorescent bulbs. Now you can get fluorescent bulbs, either compact bulbs or tubes, that are specifically for growing plants. They're called grow lights, and they emit about the right blue and red light in, in combination. So those are going to be your best bet, but you don't have to use those. They tend to be a little bit more expensive. They're not necessarily as energy efficient as some of the other bulbs. So you can use normal fluorescent tubes or compact um, fluorescent bulbs and what you would do is you would either use full spectrum bulbs because they would include the blue and the red light or one warm white and one cool white bulb and you would use the two together and that would give you a nice combination that's going to be good for your bulbs. So some options. Quick and easy way one of those shop lights that you would put in your workshop, you hang it up, usually they're four feet long, you've got two long fluorescent bulbs in it, just use one of those, hang it from the ceiling, put it on, um, I used to use sawhorses, just rest it on there, nice inexpensive way to do it. Another option is to use something like this right here. This is just a compact fluorescent bulb, a full spectrum bulb with a shade on it, a clamp. These are just parts that you can get at the hardware store. Put it together yourself. You don't need to buy anything fancy. It would clamp on a shelf and you'd have that shining down onto your lights. When it comes to lighting, something that I've been using for a long time is this kit. It comes from Gardener Supply and it includes, as you can see, two fluorescent bulbs right up there. 
Now these are a little different than the bulbs that you would see in a, in a shop light. These are much thinner. These are called T5 bulbs and um, they are pretty energy efficient but they cost more than the normal light bulbs. The beauty of it is that this hood here that goes above it is pretty shallow so it's going to take up less space. One thing I really like about this system is that you can adjust the height of this light hood simply by adjusting these toggles here on the end. And one of the things you need to know about light is that it needs to be two to four inches above the height of the seedlings. So that it needs to be really pretty close to it. And by having something like this that's adjustable, it allows you to raise the light hood as the seedlings grow. One downside to a system like this is what do you do with it when you're finished, right? You've grown your seeds, they're, they're planted in the garden. How do you store this thing? It's not the easiest thing to store. This one makes it fairly easy. If you look down here on the bottom, you can see that there's a screw. There's one on both sides. Simply unscrew that and this comes apart and you've got two pieces. You've got the upper piece and the lower piece. I put these screws in a Ziploc bag and tape it to the frame so you don't lose them. And then next spring, when you want to put your uh, light kit back up again, you just put those screws back in. So it just makes it a little easier to store. Another feature with this is it's got a simple on off switch. So you can turn the bulbs on very easily just by doing that. This is another grow light option, uh, pre-made that you can buy. If you're only growing a few seedlings, this one would be good. If you're growing a lot, obviously this isn't going to be big enough. But again, it has those grow lights inside and you can raise and lower the hood so that it's just a few inches above the seedlings. This one, I really like it. The problem is, there you go, um, it uses rubber um, O-rings to adjust the height up and down. They go here. Over the t time, they got pretty brittle and broke. So there's nothing holding this up right now. What I normally use is an elastic band and I just wrap it around there. So if you've got something like this and that O-ring's gone, don't worry about it, just use a rubber band. So once you've got your lights, you need to use them, right? Now, a lot of people say to me, well, great, if I have lights, can I just leave them on 24 hours a day? And the answer is no, you shouldn't be doing that. Here's why. Plants need a rest period in order to do something called respiration. That's part of their growth process. And they can only do that when it's dark. So if you leave it on 24 hours, they never get to fully develop. They never, need, they never get to go through that respiration period. So the recommendation is put them on pretty much while you're awake. Have your plants awake. When you go to sleep, your plants go to sleep. So put it on a timer. So you, whatever light system you're using, put it on a timer and put it on for about 18 hours a day. It can, over time, you can drop it down to 14 hours or so. Somewhere in that time frame is going to be perfect for your seedlings. Another thing to do with your lighting is to rotate your plants every week. With those, especially with those long fluorescent bulbs, they're brighter in the center and less strong near the end. So in order to make sure that all of your plants get enough light every week, you would simply turn them around. And that way they're going to get equal light and they're going to grow straight up. When, you, when you've had those fluorescent bulbs for a while, they do tend to sort of die. They get less strong and you'll notice that the ends of them tend to get a little bit darker. That's when you know it's time to replace those bulbs. It could be, it looks bright to you, but it could be up to 50% uh, less light than they normally would be giving. The other thing is clean those bulbs. Regardless of what kind of bulb you're using, make sure you clean it because again, dirt and dust on, on that can cut down significantly on the amount of light that's being emitted. And finally, how, how do you know whether the light is you know, working for your seedlings? Hold your hand right above your seedlings like this and if it's hot, if you can feel the heat, the light is too close. Move it a little further away. You don't want to burn your seedlings. They're pretty tender at this stage, so make sure that there isn't too much heat being given off by whatever bulb you're, you're using. So that is it for light. So what's next? What do you need to do? Well, obviously you need to water, right? You never stop watering. 
don't water from on top. Some people I know get out a watering can and start watering, and what happens is you kind of flatten or damage your seedlings. You don't want that to happen. You can also wash the mix right out of, out of these growing cells. So always water from the bottom. If you're using a tray like this one here, this is one of these 72 cell Jiffy pack um, growing trays, take out one of these and you pour your water into the bottom. Fill it to about a quarter the height of the uh, cells here and put that back in and let it sit for 15 to 30 minutes. At that point, if there's any water still left in the tray, pour it out. At no time do you want your seedlings sitting in water. They're just going to rot. You're going to get fungal problems and even more problems with soil gnats, which are these tiny little black fly things that come, seem to just come out of your soil. Those are pretty much inescapable, so you want to do everything you can to minimize that, and one of the ways to do that is to water properly and not have it sit in water. How do you know when it's time to water? Well, there are a few things that you can look at. One sign is going to be, does the surface of the soil look dry? Does it look a lighter color than it does uh, after you've watered it? That's a sign that it needs more water. You might also notice it, and, and these are properly moisturi moister moisturized, <laughs> uh, wet. These are properly moist, so you're, you're not gonna see it, but when it gets dry, it'll start to pull away from the edge of the cell here and that's another indication you got to water this thing. Seedlings don't like to get dried out. Their roots are pretty tender at this stage and if the soil really dries out it's going to damage the seedling and possibly kill it. So that's mo uh, moisture uh, which all seedlings need. If you're using a self-watering system like one of these it has a capillary mat underneath it and that mat then extends down into a water reservoir underneath. How it works is that this mat wicks water up from the reservoir and then it feeds it basically into these cells. So you can see underneath here, there's a pretty large opening there where the seed starting mix is in contact with that capillary mat and it's going to wick the water up. So in this case, you pour the water into the reservoir underneath the system. So that's watering. The other thing that your seedlings are going to need is food. So once they start to put out their true leaves, and you can see there's quite a difference between the leaves that come out when the seedling first emerges and the true leaves. So let's take a look at these ones. Right? These here are the, seed, the, the leaves that come out, and you can see it very well on this one here. These are the leaves that come up when the seedling first germinates, right? Those are not real leaves. That's part of essentially the, the seed. What you're looking for is these. These are the true leaves. So these are the next set of leaves that come out. Once your seedlings develop those true leaves, that's when you're going to start feeding it. You're going to fertilize it. You have a bunch of different options for fertilizing your seedlings. The point is that they need food, but not too much. So use fertilizer at a weaker strength than you normally would for say a houseplant or a plant in your garden. And you have a bunch of different options for what you can use. One nice and easy option is to use compost tea. And if you're, if you're not brewing your own, there's a really easy way to do it. You simply use compost tea bags. You just put one in a watering can overnight. The next morning, you've got a nice brew of compost tea and you would use that to water and feed your seedlings at the same time. Another option, and this is something that I do use, um, although there are some negatives to it, and that is fish fertilizer. So fish emulsion or kelp as well is another one you can do. Um, take a look at what it says on the back here in terms of how many teaspoons per gallon that you're going to use, and you would use that. The thing with this stuff is it stinks. And I use this brand, Alaska, because it tends to smell less strongly than some of the other brands. Um, so if you're in an enclosed space and smell is going to be a concern, don't use the fish emulsion. You can also use regular house plant fertilizer. So I use one that's uh, 555 and you use it at half strength. Never use that at full strength or you're just going to burn the heck out of your seedlings. The next thing your seedlings need is 
airflow. A couple of reasons for that. One, you want to make sure that the plants are getting enough air between them to avoid fungal problems because when they're packed too close to each other and it's in a moist situation, there's more chance that you're going to have fungal mold growth in, in your seedlings. You don't want that. The other reason why you want to have some sort of air circulation or breeze is that the more these plants get moved around, the stronger and stockier they are. And therefore you're going to have healthier plants. The easiest way to get that airflow is simply to put a fan, an oscillating fan. Don't have it oscillate, just have it blowing straight across. Put it right beside your seedlings and have it blowing across the surface like this. Put it on a timer, same as your lights, so when your lights are on, your fan is on. The plants get a rest at night and they get air during the day. So, you've got all the essentials in place, right? You've got light, you've got water, you've fed your seedlings, you've provided a breeze for them so they grow nice and stocky. What do you do next? Okay, you're gonna thin them. So when I planted these ones, I did something that m many people do, is I put more than one seedling in each cell. And I did that because I wasn't sure how well these seeds were going to germinate, and if I'd only put one in, I could be in a situation where I have none growing. So I put two seeds in each cell. Now that they have a couple of sets of true leaves, I need to thin that down to just one plant per cell. You don't want to have more than one. So how am I going to do that? Well, when they're this size, and these are fairly small, these are peppers, it's pretty straightforward. You're going to look and you're going to see, okay, which one of these looks the best? These two are in this cell. And this one looks larger, it's got more leaves, it looks a little stronger, so I'm going to simply pull the other one out very carefully. You have a choice with this. You can try to transplant it and put it in another pot and grow it on, or you can toss it. Right? I'm just going to toss it because I don't need that many Carolina Reaper um, peppers. Okay. When you do this, be very careful. It's so easy to damage the roots of the remaining plant in the cell. So if there is any question about whether or not you can pull this out without damaging or even pulling out the second one, then go for option B. And let me show you what that is. I have a pair of secateurs here. And let's take a look at these tomatoes. Now, I've purposely left these to grow a little bit longer than they should have. And I've got multiple, in some cases, three seedlings in a cell. So let's take a look at this one. There are three in here. I only want one. So they're so large right now and they're pretty close together that if I try pulling them out I'm probably going to end up pulling all of them out so I'm going to take the easy way I'm going to choose the one I want to keep and let's let's call it uh, that one and I'm simply going to snip the other two off at the base that's it again you've got two options you can gently pull out one of the seedlings or you can cut them off at the base. Now I know it's really hard. You don't want to start, you know, killing off all these little babies that you've raised from seed, but it is for the best of the plant. When you've got more than one in one of those little cell packs, they're competing for nutrients, they're competing for moisture, they're competing for light, and you're going to end up with plants that aren't as healthy, aren't as strong as if you had just thinned them. So go ahead, take that step and thin them down to one per cell. I just wanted to quickly show you this example of some basil seeds that I planted. Now, most of these were old seeds. I'd had them for quite a few years and I wasn't sure how well they were gonna germinate. So I put more in each planting cell here than you normally would. Normally, I'd basil, I'd put two or three in each one. You can see this one here, I put a ton of them in there and they all came up. So now I have a gazillion pieces of basil growing in here and I need to thin that out. I can't possibly grow that many in one cell. So since they're so close together, I'm going to go through and just snip out a few. Basil's one of those plants where I tend to grow more of them in a cell and transplant them so that I have, say, three or four growing together. It makes a nice bushy plant that I would then put in a container. So I'm going ahead and, and thinning those out. 
But if you look at these ones here, you'll see that this one didn't germinate very much. So I've got one there, I've got a couple there, none at all here. And this one, the seeds, you know, some of them germinated here and some of them germinated, more of them germinated there. It's kind of just luck. So don't be frustrated if you see that some of your seeds are germinating and others aren't. When it gets to the point that you think it should have germinated by now, and if you look at the seed packet, it'll tell you how long it takes to germinate seeds. So most of them do that. Uh, Renee's Garden has fantastic seeds that have a lot of information on the back of them about when you can expect germination to occur. Uh, Botanical Interest does as well. So if you see that, say it's supposed to germinate in 10 days and after two weeks, some of these cells have nothing in it, go ahead and put more seeds in and start again because they're not going to germinate late, most likely. So um, just don't worry about it and put more seeds in. So the final thing, and this is optional, is to repot your transplants if it's going to be several weeks before you're going to get them into the garden. So generally speaking, once they get pretty large, so rule of thumb, you know, this isn't perfect, but if your plant is about two times as high as the cell that it's sitting in, and often that means you can start to see roots coming out of the bottom, then you might want to consider planting it into a larger pot for the three, four weeks or so uh, until you can get it into the garden. That gives it more room to develop, it gives it access to more nutrients, more, more moisture, and the roots will have space to start to, to grow stronger and bigger. So how do you do that? Well, first of all, you need a pot to put it into, and a three to four inch pot is going to be perfect. I know some people use styrofoam cups or maybe those, you know, those uh, red party cups. Um, I prefer to reuse things or use things that are biodegradable. So some options. Um, these are simply pots that I just bought some annual plants in. They came in these pots. These are perfect. Just use those. Make sure you wash them well before you use them. So that's one option. You can go with biodegradable pots. There are peat pots. There are ones, if you're, if you're concerned about sustainability and rather not use peat, you can use cocoa coir. Or uh, these are cow pots. They're made out of pressed cow manure. With all of those pots, when you plant them in the garden, they will degrade. And as they do, they're going to release uh, nutrients and organic matter into the garden. So they'll help to amend the soil and have a great growing environment for the plant. So that's another option. And then you can buy pots. So these are just four inch pots that I bought. I have a ton of them. They all line up very nicely. So that's what I'm going to use. So how do you do this? How do you take this seedling and get it into here without damaging it? Well, first of all, you've got to put soil in here. Right. So we're going to use potting mix. Now, when we started the seeds, we used a special seed starting mix. When you transplant them into a larger pot, you can use a good potting mix. I use an organic potting mix because, well, I grow everything organically. You don't have to do that. Before you put your potting mix into the pots, make sure that it is nicely moist. And it's probably going to take a lot more water than you think to get it adequately moist. How do you know if it's moist enough? Well, if you grab a handful and squeeze it, it should hold together. But when you juggle it around, it should break apart. You don't want any water to squeeze out of it when you squeeze it. And you want it to be able to hold together. If it doesn't, it's too dry. So once you have it nice and moist, simply put it in your pot and then press a hole in the middle. That's where your seedling is going to go. Now to get the seedling out of here, never grab it by the stem. If you damage the stem, it's only got one stem and the thing is going to be dead. So never grab it by there. If you're going to grab it by anything, grab it by the leaves because it can replace leaves. It can't replace the stem. But you probably don't want to just pull it straight out. It's better to try to push it up from the bottom. right? And try to take it out in one piece like this. Now you can see the roots on there and you can see how the roots are circling around. So this was definitely time to transplant it. You're just going to plop it into your hole. You want the surface to be at the same level as the potting mix. And you'll firm it in. 
and that's it. Now your potting mix is nice and moist so you don't need to water it from the top at this point. Just like with your seedlings you're going to water it from underneath so you're going to put this on a waterproof tray of some kind. Uh, this is a boot tray, it works beautifully. I line up all the pots in this and simply water from the bottom. If that potting mix dries out, you'll, you'll notice it because it starts to get dry on top, it turns a lighter color, it starts to pull away from the edges of the pot. You might at that point need to water it from the top to re-moisten the potting mix. When it's dry, it doesn't really wick very well from underneath. So um, at that point, carefully water it from on top. Don't, don't take out your watering can and, and flatten this thing. Okay, so you've got now you, all your seedlings. They're either in, in your cell packs or they're in pots. And it's time to start thinking about putting them out in the garden. Don't just take it like this and go plant it. You'll probably end up with a dead plant. Uh, you need to do something called hardening off, which means slowly over time exposing them to the kind of conditions that they're going to be in when they're planted in your garden. So take them outside, put them in the shade, for a couple of hours on the first day. The next day, maybe a few more hours. Slowly, over the course of a few days, you're going to put them in the sun for a little while. And by the time four or five days have gone by, depending on the weather and the temperatures, they're probably okay to leave them outside overnight. Just make sure that it's over 50 degrees outside. Again, it depends on your plants, but if you're growing things like these, these are peppers or tomatoes or other warm season plants, you want to make sure that it's going to be over 50 degrees uh, before you start hardening them off, and then they will be ready to plant in the garden. Once you've got it potted up, don't forget to put a label on it. So I know this one is a Tibetan Lhasa pepper, so I'm going to put a label in there with it, and you can use all sorts of things. I mean popsicle sticks, although they will dissolve and deteriorate over the season, so those aren't so great. I like these. I bought them on Amazon um, plastic, and um, you just write on it what it is and stick it in there. There's also this one, and this is the one I'm going to use this time. This is for botanical interests. I haven't tried it yet, so fair warning, but it allows you to put the variety and the date that it's planted right there on it and stick it in with your plant. I've done it where I forgot to stick the labels in and um, three months later I had no idea what any of these peppers were which wasn't a great way to go about doing it. You can also use, as one, one of our uh, viewers suggested in, in another one of our videos, Venetian blinds. If you have some old ones, I mean who doesn't have mini blinds or, or something like that that they're throwing away or that you find in uh, somebody else's garbage <laughs> or trash can. Just cut that into lengths and use that to write on. They make fantastic markers in the garden. Uh, might as well reuse stuff that's already out there. So thanks for checking out this video on what to do with seeds after they germinate. Now, I'm curious, what are you growing? What seeds have you planted and how are, the, how are they doing? Let me know in the comments below. I'd love to hear from you. And also, if you'd like to see more videos from the Gardening Products Review, just hit the subscribe button. We put one out every week on Thursday, so look for those videos. Also, take a look at the notes underneath, because everything I talked about today, I will have some notes there about where you can get it, uh, any information that you might need. There's a free download about growing seeds, and you'll also find down there um, links to the reviews of some of the products that we've done over on the gardening product review. So happy seed growing. Until later, I'm Monica Hemingway with the gardening products review. Now one thing that you need to know about light 